Let's visit the 90s all over again. Put on those hammer pants. This is Dope Nostalgia. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dope Nostalgia for another exciting episode. My name is Naomi, your host. Today, we're talking about a Canadian boy band that came out right when NSYNC, Backstreet, 98 Degrees were all the hottest things on the charts, and they were called Before Four. If you're Canadian, you probably remember these three boys. They had a very unique look and kind of risque songs. So our good friend John G is going to be my co-host today, and we're going to go back in time and revisit the boy band era and before four. Here's a little bit of information about them. Wikipedia moment. Please bear in mind that Wikipedia is not to be taken as actual 100% fact. Any donkey could edit it at any time. If I'm reading you the artist's bio, that stuff is a real truth. B44, the letter B, the number four, dash number four. That's how it was known, but later was known as the word spelled out B44. They were a Canadian boy band from Toronto, Ontario. The band was comprised of twins Ryan and Dan Kowarski, along with Ohad Einbinder. They were signed to Sony Records and achieved commercial success in Canada and later toured as Before Four in Germany. The Kowarskis and Einbinder were friends for several years before the group officially formed in 1998. After an audition for Mike Roth of Toronto's Sony Records Studios, they were signed to the label. They also signed a publishing deal with Sony. In 2000, they released their debut album, Before Four. Before Four achieved success in Canada with the single Get Down and its accompanying video, and later, Go Go. Other releases included Every Day and Ball and Chain. The album was certified platinum in Canada. In the summer of 2001, Before Four joined Snow, Wave, and Soul Decision on the YTV Psycho Blast Tour and opened for Destiny's Child on MTV's Total Request Live Tour. They were also nominated for Best New Group at the 2001 Juno Awards. Also, in 2001, they starred in the episode Howlin' with Before Four in the TV series Eddie the Eco Dog Unleashed. Now, following their success in Canada, the trio headed to Germany, signing with Universal Music and Polydor under the name Before Four spelled out with the words. In 2003, they released their second album, In Your Face. That album generated three singles, Player, You're My Ecstasy, ooh, let me say that right, Player, parentheses, You're My Ecstasy, parentheses, I'll Be There, and Feel Free, parentheses, To Say No, parentheses. Before Four disbanded in 2004, Ryan and Dan went on to form the vocal, musical, songwriting, and producing duo Ryan Dan. In 2021, Get Down was used as a lip sync for your life number in episode 7 of Canada's Drag Race second season with which Geometric won her lip sync competition. You know who knows a lot about Before Four? I'll tell you who. Our guest today. You know him from his TikTok, his Instagram, and all his amazing nostalgic knowledge of the early 2000s. Welcome John G to Dope Nostalgia. How's it going? Good. And we're both wearing our Much Music swag, which is fun. Oh, nice. Did you, uh, oh, you got that at the, uh, at the show? Yes. Yeah. We got, my friend and I got the hoodies. Yeah. And it's going to be on Crave end of this month, I believe. Yeah. Originally it was slotted for December 8th and that's what we were pushing, but yeah, it took a little longer, but I'm glad it's going to be on Crave really soon. Yeah, yeah. How uh, how were your holidays and uh, New Year? Oh, good. Same old thing. Family's all here, so it's uh doesn't change. What about you? Yeah. Uh, so my family's in Montreal. So first I went to Montreal, and then I went to Ottawa to see my good friend. So yeah, it was nice. Sweet. Now, when you when someone who lives in Toronto goes to Montreal, usually do you drive up there or do you fly? I usually take the train. I mean, it's always nice to drive if possible, but honestly, the train is the cheaper option usually. Mm-hmm. So that's what I do. Yeah. 
How long does it take to get there? It's not bad. It's it's about the same as driving. It's like five and a half hours. There's plenty of space. You know, you can move around. I always pick an aisle seat so I can get up whenever I want. So it's it's not that bad. That's the Via train, right? Yeah, Is the Via not? train. I mean, to be honest, it, it's not bad. But at the same time, there's usually always a bit of a delay. It's just, it's the one rail. It, you know, there's no other rails except for Via, I guess. So um, mm -hmm. it can be delayed sometimes. Um, but overall, it's not bad. Canada is going to work on their rail situation. <laughs> yeah, compared to like Japan. It's funny. I was talking to a guy, uh, an employee when I just went there on VN. And I'm like, so when are we going to get a bullet train? He's like, never. <laughs> like, great. Montreal to Toronto would probably be the first place to put one. They've think. talked about it. It's just, you know, I don't know, whatever bullshit, red tape, bureaucracy, you know, stuff. Who knows? They constantly talk about one from Edmonton to Calgary that would take half an hour to 45 minutes. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't see it, but who knows? What's the drive normally between those two? Three hours. Three hours. Yeah. No, it's, and that's less than Montreal, Toronto, but I'm sure it would still be, I'm sure people commute there for work, right? In between each. They do. They do. A lot of times they just fly too, depending. Um, Cause there's probably about at least 10 to 12 flights from the two cities back and forth every day because a lot of flights don't even come directly out of Edmonton you have to go to Calgary to go to a lot of places Edmonton okay, airport is no good <laughs> are you Edmonton or Calgary I'm in Edmonton all right Edmonton I'm um, funny I, I don't know why I just randomly I'll apply for jobs and then like I just saw this Calgary job I'm like I'm gonna apply for it so I did today I doubt anything will come of it but eh. it's a great city I mean I yeah. know there's that rivalry we have but I I've, I've always enjoyed going to Calgary it feels really clean well kept i don't know it's really pretty i no no dissing my own city but <laughs> yeah. they also have a very good view of the mountains from calgary too so okay. it's pretty cool yeah it's funny how canadians talk in uh driving distances by how long does it take to get there i mean yeah that's that's usually like, how like I, I couldn't tell you like uh, kilometers would be like, uh, it's uh, about five well, hours yeah, and it's also really funny when you compare a place like Toronto to Ottawa, where my friend was, and like Ottawa, a drive in Ottawa that takes like 20 minutes to 30 minutes, it's, it's considered long, whereas in Toronto, that's like normal or short, so mm -hmm. it's funny. Yeah, well, I'm really grateful for your time because it was really fun doing the Moffats episode with you. We really had a great experience doing that. And tell everybody about your channel, on uh, your TikTok and everything, because... It's awesome, especially if you're into like early 2000s Canadiana music knowledge. So, yeah. Yeah, I've been, and thank you for having me on again. I mean, yeah, I forget when we did that Moffitt's podcast. It seems like forever ago, but I feel like it was maybe a year ago or less. It's probably been about a year. Yeah. Yeah. And that was again, you know, since then, of course, I think we both tried to, uh, to get at least one of the Moffitt's on our respective channels and it hasn't happened yet, but who knows? Maybe it'll happen in the future. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, I've done this since like 2021 uh, summer. And yeah, just focusing on nostalgia, especially since I grew up in the 90s and 2000s. And I used to work in radio. So that's why I have all this Canadian music knowledge in my head. And then, of course, I've, uh, I've interviewed many artists and I still continue to do that. And I just hope that'll continue and grow and who knows where it'll take me. Um, I'm going to the Junos in March for the first time, which I'm very excited for. So I look forward to that. That's amazing. Is it, is it Hamilton this year? No, it's in Halifax. Oh, Halifax. That's so cool. Because then you get to go out east too. I've never been out. Yeah, so I'm born and raised in Montreal. I've never been east of Quebec. So this will be my first time in the, uh, in the Maritimes. Yeah. Oh, there's going to be so much you can do. I'm sure you're going to share all that video footage with us. Yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm only there from the 22nd to the 25th, basically, because I want to go to as many Juno events, because, you know, they have the events leading up to the awards, mm -hmm. um, then the awards itself on the 24th, the Sunday. Um, my main goal is to interview Nelly Furtado, because she's the host, and she no is way. Awesome. she's an icon, so that's my main goal, yeah. I know, I've been watching your channel, and you've been basically, you know, very politely pleading for her to come join the show. <laughs> I did that for a little bit. And then honestly, I just stopped. I kind of gave up, to be honest. But I'll I'll resume that the closer we get to that date, because I, I definitely would like to get her attention. If not, 
to be mm-hmm. honest, like I have like one contact that could maybe help me, but it's not a guarantee. So we'll see. I'll be rooting for you. This is going to happen. <laughs> Nelly, if you're out there, make it so. It would be amazing. But yeah. yeah. So where can people find you on TikTok? Yeah. So on TikTok uh, and also same thing on Instagram, it's just john.g87. So J-O-N dot G87. Perfect. And we're here today to talk about what I think was the greatest Canadian boy band. Ooh, great. I mean, I, I don't know if I could say that. There's a lot of them. <laughs> People don't know there was a lot. Of course, we've talked about the Moffats. I kind of consider the Moffats more of an actual band band. Yeah. But when you're talking about like choreography, dancing, singing and whatnot, this is where Before Four was a very big leader in Canadian boy band history. Yeah, and it's 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 weird. It's and that's why I'm always not sure to say whether they're the best Canadian boy band because when you think about it, they weren't really here for a long time. They had two albums, technically only one was released in Canada, and they mm-hmm. were only there for like three, four years or so. So it's it's weird. But they had, of course, obviously one huge song with Get Down, but then they had a other few other couple songs that did well in Canada. But um yeah, I think the fact that we're talking about them now just shows the impact that they had on us. They did. Um, I think they were mostly memorable because of the look. They had a very targeted specific look. I mean, people were doing the whole Jersey shore type of look already during this era with the spike tips, like the, the bleach tips and like the tans and all of that. But these guys did it like to the max. Exactly. And it's funny you bring that up because, yeah, people think Jersey Shore, like, oh, they, they were these trendsetters, these pioneers. Like, no, they I don't I don't know if B44 were the first to do this, but like they made it very popular in the 2000s. And like many young boys, I definitely had frosted tips. I didn't have puka shells, but I had some type of necklace um, and I had lots of gel in my hair and it was pointy at some point. So, mm-hmm. yeah, or they were super influential, 100 percent. Yeah, like they definitely carried that look out. And I mean, yeah, Jersey Shore, I think, I don't know. You know, I never really watched it. Oh, no? No, I didn't. Oh. I tried. I watched like two episodes of it and then I never returned. It's, <laughs> I mean, listen, it's trash TV, but I, I grew up on that stuff. Mm-hmm. I love reality TV. Um, It was right up my alley. So uh, it, it was a special time. <laughs> it really was a special time. Um, I know this podcast is primarily 90s, but this does count because they did get together in the very late 90s and they released their first album in 2000. What exactly. do you know? Of, what do you know of their backstory, where they came from, how they got together? Yeah. So, I mean, from what I understood, you know, just doing research, um, they got together. I, I don't know. I don't know what the age is exactly, but apparently they were around 16 years old. When they got together so basically you see of course the two brothers uh dan and ryan who um apparently were born in cincinnati and then grew up in toronto specifically in thornhill which is just north of the city and then they met their friend uh ohad who was i believe born in israel and then moved to uh to toronto uh for a long time i think a lot of people including myself thought that maybe they were all related or they were all brothers but no mm-hmm. it's ryan and dan the twins and then ohad they all met and then the story goes apparently they hopped in a taxi and they're like take us to sony and they went to sony they sang a song for like some people and i, and I think then someone you know caught their attention and um or they caught someone's attention and apparently within like a few days they were signed which sounds a little too too good to be true if if you ask me yeah. but <laughs> Maybe that's the case. And yeah, once they were signed, they kind of blew up really quickly. And then one of the fun facts that I love and the things that I've actually talked about on my channel recently is about their connections with other fellow Canadian uh, singers and artists. So for instance, their their debut album, B44, most of it was produced and their big songs, including Get Down, um, Every Day and Go Go, those are the three big songs. They were all produced by uh, Jay Levine and James Brian McCollum, otherwise known as Prozac, which yes. is an amazing, such a cool fact, right? Exactly. I When I found that out, I was a bit mind blown, but it makes sense. It does. 
Well, yeah, especially if you really look into James and Jay's um, past, not only were they in, first of all, they were in Philosopher Kings, which to be honest was a bit before my time, but I've listened to their music a bit. Mm -hmm. Then they went into Prozac. But if you look into their production, you know, credibility, um, they've worked with a lot of artists, a lot of Canadian artists besides B44. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't shock me that, I, although I would like to know how they got together. Um, because uh, that I'm really curious about. So. How the two parties met and decided to work together would be a great story. We've had James on the show. Um, so I wonder if we reach out oh. to see if he can answer that question for us on social media. That would be really cool. That's cool. Yeah, he's he seems just like a really talented dude. Um, I spoke with Luke McMaster from McMaster and James recently, who's worked with James as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he kind of has his his hand in lots of different genres uh, all over Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I must tell people to go check out your um, Luke McMaster interview too, because it was really cool to hear what he's been up to, you know? Yeah. And and again, another cool, can I, I learned a, a lot about him, especially the fact that he's still in touch with Rob James from McMaster and James. And he actually went to his wedding, he said recently, and he performed love wins every time at his wedding at rob james wedding so like i wish there was i hope there's footage of that because i told him i would love to see it you know yes so oh that yeah, would have been amazing. amazing super talented i again i think just because growing up in just canadian artists unfortunately as a whole i think don't get enough credit um but luke and james and many others they um extremely talented yes yes and i mean there's obviously a connection there because They've all made many hits together, and I think it's great. Um, when I was um, listening to the music of that era, too, I didn't really take Before Four very seriously. Um, I kind of, and I think a lot of other people, too, kind of looked at them as a bit of a parody or a, well, I don't think they were trying to be a parody. I honestly think that they were serious about their music and their mm -hmm. look and everything. How do you feel about that? You know, you're 100% right. And you look at, especially the comments on YouTube, YouTube or, <laughs> excuse me, I'm going through puberty still. <laughs> comments on YouTube or anywhere. And of course, the main thing is because they're going to focus on their looks first. Mm -hmm. um, easy. It's an easy target, to be honest. But again, a lot of people had that look, whether they want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. um, they look at their songs. Again, their big hit, Get Down. Yes, we learn later on that it's all about oral sex. And it's just crazy that, again, like, they claim that, yeah, they, well, of course they knew because they made the song, what it was about, but I don't think any kids knew, maybe the adults knew, but we were all singing it at the top of our lungs and like clearly shouldn't yep. have been at all, which is hilarious. Perfectly written, um, went right over your head. <laughs> but that, and, exactly. But at the same time, that's like every pop song back then. And even still to this day, almost, although now people are catching on more, oh, but like yeah. that was, the, it wasn't just them. It was every pop song for the most part. So people give it to you by Jordan I, Knight was one of those. Of course, got to give a shout out to Jordan. You're. <laughs> <laughs> How do I not? But, yes. Okay. Continue. Sorry. No, 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 of course. And then, uh, so yeah, so, and that kind of bugs me. And it's funny that you bring that up because I've been thinking about this and I, I'm going to make a video about it. And I think they were, they were, I'm not comparing them exactly, but them and Nickelback. So Nickelback, before everyone goes, whoa, 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 we don't want to compare B44 and Nickelback. But what my theory is, obviously it was cool to hate on Nickelback. And now people are finally kind of changing that tune and they're, they're not hating them anymore. Mm -hmm. I think B44 and a lot of other bands that people like to make fun of, again, will kind of, it'll happen like Nickelback where people slowly realize. And honestly, I hope people like myself and maybe you will help bring that change and remind people that yes, it might've been a little cringy at the time, but overall, they, in my opinion, they're very talented. Again, they were no, they were not as successful as Nickelback. I'm not even, I'm not saying that, but in terms of talent, I would say they're very talented. I mean, the mm -hmm. two of them, Ryan and Dan worked with Shania Twain. They sang on her tour with her. You have and to they be talented. Produce. They, and they produce a lot of music. They do for a lot of so, artists that people know now. Exactly. So again, like, I'm not saying they're just as good as, well, that's subjective. They're not as, they weren't as successful as Nickelback, but I would say they were as talented mm -hmm. and um, people need to just, yeah, get over this whole, oh, it's all about sex and, uh, oh, it's so cringy. Like for the time, maybe it was, but again, they still made good music for me also in terms of like their best songs. I actually love their song every day 
off their mm-hmm. first album. It's a great ballad. Um, so yeah, this whole making fun of them, it's it's just, it's corny at this point. It really is. It's a beautiful ballad. In fact, we'll play a clip of it because uh, I wanted people to hear some of the other songs. <laughs> something that I would like to say to you. I made up my mind, and if you feel the same, I swear that I will be there every day. Every day. It's funny because I'll I'll never I always always love that lyric um, about wanting her to come over to my house. <laughs> There's so many good listen. Oh, I love that. There's I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna set your spirit free. That's another one in there. Mm-hmm. And also the and again I know why people like to make fun because the video it's it's out there. I mean you have the little kid who finds this. It was called a viewfinder, I believe. Yes. And he, like, I think he gets it from a homeless person first. And then he looks into it. He sees before four. And then you see these different scenarios in the music video where he's like on a beach. There's these muscle men. There's these cute young girls. And then the funniest thing is at the end, he like gives the viewfinder to like the homeless guy as if like, yeah, like this is what you want instead of change or or food. Just take this and you can look at before four all day. (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be really helpful for you. Enjoy. Exactly. Uh, again, I, I totally understand why people would would make fun of the video itself. Um, but again, that was the time. That was the era. There were so many cheesy videos back then. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, this song, again, we're talking about it. And so many people have talked about it on social media for over the past couple of decades, including myself and you. So mm-hmm. clearly it has some weight to it. There, it. People like the song. Otherwise, they would never talk about it. I think here we are 30 years later and people look back at this song and this era and this group with fondness. You know, yeah. I think, I think it's more of that now than it was back then. People will be of like, course. you remember before four, they were awesome. You know, it's, it's kind of more of that, which I like. It's that nostalgic part. A hundred percent. And I think it, it it's always, everything comes full circle, you know, like right now we're in 2023. I don't know. You'll have to wait until 20. And to be honest, a lot of the music now, I'm not a huge fan of. And I'm, I say that as a millennial who grew up again, like in the 2000s. And there's a reason why we prefer that type of music versus today's music. But again, mm-hmm. we might look back in, in 20 years from now and it's 2043 and we'll look at 2023 and be like, oh, remember these songs? Who knows? That's always how it works. And I think that we always have a built in fondness for the music we grew up on, the music that we chose for ourselves to listen to for the first time that our parents didn't just play. And you, you know what I mean? I think that will always stay with you. A hundred percent. Yes. So like you said, yeah, we are fond of nineties, two thousands. Our parents are fond of sixties, seventies. I mean, we like that music as well, but we didn't grow mm-hmm. up with it, but mm-hmm. we still appreciate it. So yeah. hundred percent. Right now we are so young and free, but we're running out of time.
getting those messages on my answering machine like we used to back in the day. What I'd really love is to hear from you, the listeners of Dope Nostalgia. This is your chance to be on the show, giving feedback, telling us what you love, what you hate, and who you'd like to see more of. Call us at our new toll-free number, 1-888-741-9192. Leave us some feedback. Your message could be played on the show. So give us a call. 1-888-741-9192. Toll free. Hey, everybody. I'm Rick Campanelli, and you're listening to the Dope Nostalgia Podcast. This is pretty basic. It just says that you, the Backstreet Boys, agreed to appear at a Burger King, yada, yada. And what's the yada, yada? A little commercial. Forget it. We don't do commercials. Not our style, man. We wouldn't even do this for a lifetime supply of free Whoppers. Does that rock or what? Now get live music from the Millennium Tour and a new song from their upcoming album on three CDs for two ninety nine each with any value meal. I was looking at some articles here, and I haven't even read this one yet, but it said, B44, remember that time they opened a fake Josie and the Pussycats concert in Vancouver? What yeah. do you know about this, John? Well, uh, I mean, what I know, I, I read the article, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but no, it's, I mean, kind of, and it's funny, I'm going to say the Coles Notes version of this. And I say Coles Notes because I said Coles Notes on a video recently. And then people are like, what's Coles Notes? Or who's Cole? And I'm like, Oh yeah, not everyone is from Canada. They're like, there's Cliff's Notes. That was the American version of Cole's yeah. Notes. So, anyways, that was funny. Um, remembering Cole's Notes, but the ver- mm-hmm. that the, the summarized version of the Josie and the Pussycats. First of all, I've never seen the movie. Have you? No. I, maybe I'll watch it after learning more about this. But long story short, in the Josie and the Pussycats, uh, it's like this fictional band. And honestly, honestly, I don't know much more about it. They go on an I know, adventure, I assume. I know that Rachel Lee Cook was in it. <laughs> and I Tara, think, oh, Tara Reid yeah, was Tara Reed, Dawson. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so apparently for part of the shoot, um, it turns out they it was B44 that was in a scene. But so when they panned to the crowd and they were screaming, whatever, it was actually B44 that was on stage that elicited that reaction. So they all performed. It was called the Pacific Coliseum, I believe, in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so B44, it, it was it was advertised as a B44 um, like concert or whatever. So people knew that they were going to see B44. But then I assume they were told that it was for this movie, I'm guessing. But mm-hmm. it's just cool that, again, the reactions from the crowd in the movie are for B44 and not for this band in the movie. Ah, I get it. I get it. I need to go watch it now just because I'm, I don't think they don't show them at all. Like they don't show B44 because I don't think legally they're allowed to probably or it wouldn't make any sense. Okay. But so um, yeah, no, that was cool. And it's funny because it was Ohad that was interviewed for that uh, story. And he talks about how they were like, was that the first time you performed for a crowd? He's like, no, the first time we performed for a crowd was in front of 10,000 mostly girls for like a girl's guide thing at the Sky Dome in Toronto. And like the or late 90s or 2000s oh wow yeah so um yeah no they uh they kind of hit the ground running and then they did the psycho blast tour either 2000 or 2001 which i didn't go to but like that was like a canadian kids dream i feel like back then it had all, had all these classic bands like b44 soul decision mcmaster and james the list goes on yes. and on yes that that would have been great i wonder if wave was there remember wave I want to say I think they were. I mean, everyone knows the one song, um, California. And I'm actually yeah. trying to, um, because one of them, he passed away. I forget his name. Oh, no. But yeah, the one surviving member, Dave Thompson, who I've learned also, like kind of like James Brian McCollum from Prozac, Dave Thompson has worked with a lot of artists. He's he's big into producing and songwriting. So he worked with um, Dan Davidson, who I interviewed recently. Uh, he's he's from Edmonton. Under- yeah, Dan exactly. Davidson? I know him. Yeah, yeah it's pretty get, cool. Have you talked to him? I should ask him to be on the show. I knew him back from his Tupelo Honey days. Right. That's I, so where... that, yeah. Yeah. Tupelo, so I'm assuming Tupelo Honey was mostly known in the West, like in your part of Canada. In- yeah, and they were they were really doing making a building a big name for themselves and making a lot of good connections. I, you know, their songs were incredible. 
they were a great band. But yeah, they did open for Bon Jovi when Bon Jovi toured in Alberta. So that was really cool. But yeah, yeah, I should talk to Dan Davidson. He's a really nice guy. And I really respect him because he kind of, he um, turned to like country because now he's all about country music and he really pushes the boundaries about what it is to make country music. And he, he talks about that in this like little documentary that he made. And in part of that documentary, he goes to New York with Dave Thompson from Wave because um, they're very close. So, and they work together. So yeah, I, that was really cool. Um, so yeah, maybe Wave was in that, but um, mm. yeah, Psycho Blast Tour, I, I wish I could have attended that. No doubt. I wish I could turn back time and go to that too. But uh, yeah, they also did a, an MTV tour. They must have toured in the States then. I did honestly, I didn't, I didn't really read much about that. I feel like they did most of their touring in Canada, but maybe they did a, a bit in the US. Um, the weird thing about them, from what I gathered, is they did mm. kind of instead of what most bands do or artists, where a lot of bands will start in Germany, kind of test their waters there, and then go back to the to North America where they're from, mm. um, like Backstreet Boys. Yeah. We did first amongst other bands, but they did the opposite. They started here in Canada primarily, and then B44 went to Germany for their second album, and it was only released in Germany. It's called In Your Face. And unfortunately, in my opinion, not their, not a great album. Um, it just had a different sound. It, it just felt forced to me. Um, yeah. They're using, I feel like, a bit more Spanish guitar, which is not bad, but it just sounded, I don't know, didn't seem right for them, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe, maybe it's because of this, but the two guys from Prozac did not do much production on that second album as much as the first. So I think maybe that is maybe why also it wasn't as good in my opinion. I wonder Um, if they were, since they were doing so much in Germany at the time, I wonder if they were working with European producers and writers too. I mean, maybe possibly, I don't know. Um, Dive into it. Yeah. And then after that, I'm assuming, I guess the people behind their record labels just saw maybe how, it didn't do that well. And they were probably like, Oh, I guess we're just going to give up on them. Um, or maybe they left. Honestly, I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, as you, both of us know, it's like, we've been trying to reach out to them to do an interview. I, well, did you say you've tried to reach out to Ohad or, or the twins? Yes, I have tried to reach out to both. Um, and Ohad, interestingly enough, I found him on LinkedIn. It looks like he's a co-founder CEO of a company called Circa. Um, based yeah, out of Beverly Hills. He does really well. So it's kind of like, I want to say they're kind of like modular homes. Um, mm. I don't know if it's specifically meant for like laneways, but it's like these smaller, I think, homes. I could be wrong. Um, he does really well. I've been, it's funny, I've been in contact with him for well over a year now and just bugging him basically for over a year trying to get this interview. And, you know, I know, and they've talked about this in old interviews where like as after B4 Forward, they just, not always want to talk about that time. And I get it. Yeah. Cause again, part of it is one, they were maybe embarrassed or because of all the hate that they got, which I understand again, same thing with Nickelback. Like I don't care mm-hmm. how successful you are. If you keep seeing all this hate towards you, it's going to affect you eventually. So I think that maybe has something to do with it. Why they wouldn't want to talk about that past. And I, and I get that. Um, but I, I I'm hoping to convey this message to him or the twins. If I ever get to talk to them is listen, I just want to kind of, take a trip down memory lane and just remind people like this time and that you guys truly are talented um, and just kind of give you the flowers that you deserve. Yes. That's a great way to put it. Honestly. Yeah. So I, I really hope one of us at least gets to do it. I know. So it's funny. Um, uh, the two twins, it's a, uh, they run a, a dog kennel up mm-hmm. in Cookstown, uh, camp Cookstown, I believe it is. And I don't know how it started, but apparently it had something to do with like back in the day when they were touring, they had dogs and like, they just felt bad that they would leave them. So I guess maybe that was the inspiration for making mm-hmm. this, this kennel, which is like about an hour North of Toronto. So, um, yeah. And I've looked it up and it seems like a really awesome spot if you want to take your dog and yeah, both the twins, I believe Ryan and Dan work there. I don't know. I guess they own it. They run it. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of social media, like they have Instagram, I've, I've tried contacting both of them, no responses. I even tried contacting, contacting one of their wives, not to sound creepy, but like, just I'll try anything. Um, she didn't respond. That's fine. Um, I did try to ask, uh, I know Ed, I interviewed Ed the sock. He interviewed them a long time ago. He said he might have a connection. 
heat, but it was tough. So um, right now it's a uh, nothing so far. So we'll see. I did hear back from one of the twins. Um, yeah. Uh, when I approached them to do the show and I received a beautiful answer and it basically speaks to what we were saying. They told mm -hmm. me about like their beautiful life now, how happy they are in the place they're at, that they're very grateful for our interest or for my interest in talking to them, but it's the past kind of deal. That's kind when, of the, the, the effect I got from that, but they were so nice about it. So nice. When was this? How long ago did they respond? I'm going to say probably about six months ago was when I got oh. the response. But That's so nice I was just, it, it made me happy because he didn't just ignore. He like was like, okay, yeah, this is really cool that you want to do this. And this is where we're at right now. And we're really happy, but thank you for asking kind of thing. It was really cool. No, that, and that's very nice, but it, it just, and again, like I would never be the type to keep like bugging and like harass anyone. It just, I, 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 honestly, like my main thing is I just hope that they know that like people appreciate them as artists and their music because mm -hmm. the last thing it would just, it would, and I don't know them personally. So it's like, why do I care? I, I don't know. I just, cause I'm passionate about Canadian music. Um, so yeah, I honestly just hope that they know that they have, they had, they had, the, they had a big fan base and they still have people like me and you and others that appreciate their music. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't want them to feel like, Oh, like you were just made fun of. Um, no, no, they're, they're very talented. So yeah. I'm so happy that uh, we decided to talk about them together because this is a show I've wanted to do for a while. Um, before four, I think we're a big part of the Canadian pop identity during that time. So I think they need to know that too. A hundred percent. Yeah. Listen. Um, yeah. You can't. Uh, yeah. Two thousands Canadian pop. Um, B44, I think was one of the top names at the list or one of the biggest names at the top of the list, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, I think they probably inspired other bands after them. Yeah. So I'm trying to think, I guess it was all around the same time. There was a ID, there was well, Sky, it was two of them, but they were. VIP? There was one called V. Didn't they do that song? It's just my luck. She's on the dirt. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, and that's the only song I knew. And oh, like, oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit corny. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that song. Fun. That was the time, but um, yeah, no, it's anyways. They're uh, they're amazing, and honestly, every time I bring them up in in a video or whatever, people are like, oh, it's like the B four four. And also, the funniest thing, by the way, we haven't even talked about this yet, but the fact that I didn't know this forever, the fact that B four four, what it means, it's like B four four is three, and there's three of them. I was like, yeah. how do I not know this? <laughs> No it seems like the simplest thing doesn't it it's yeah great. and the funniest thing i don't know why they did this but they went from so it, it went the letter b the number four dash the number four and then when they went over to their second album and went to germany they changed it to b44 but spelled out b44 yeah so i don't know if that was a way to like take them more seriously or i don't know but 
I just thought that was always funny how we, I never knew at least. And I think a lot of people didn't know what B44 actually meant. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's it. Have we, have we covered everything? <laughs> everything about B44. Ooh, is there anything else I want to talk about? Ooh, uh, there's definitely more to talk about. Always. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, I was going to actually ask you too about your, um, because you've had Rick Campanelli. Now you've spoken to him. You went to the Much Music uh, documentary, 299 Queen Street West, as did I. You got some great footage from that event. I was, uh, I was so happy. Um, so I've been, I've been fortunate enough to talk to Rick now, interview him tw twice, technically three times with this red carpet thing. He was my first interview ever. And then um, leading up to the documentary, I was like, hey, I'd love to talk to you again to promote it. He said yes, because he's just amazing super mm -hmm. generous and then you know the time came and i interviewed him i interviewed interviewed sook yin who is hilarious she's just like that. blunt in your face oh yeah i love it and then uh, i interviewed uh gee, sean menard the director um mm -hmm. and bill walichka who i also spoke and you spoke to bill of course yeah. um such a sweet guy he he uh, he has to be one of the most humble people i think i've ever met um and he actually just got a new role at uh, at a Kingston radio station, actually. So, fun oh, fact. that's wonderful news. And, yeah. and he's been promoting his book. He has a book out now. Yes. Oh, I, I still haven't got. I need to. I need to read it. Um. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, so I got to interview people there, and, and that was amazing. Um, and it's just funny looking back because I again I made a video kind of my first time interviewing Rick, I was like, and this was back in 2021 or something. And I was like, wouldn't it be great to have like a reunion of some kind with much music? And he was like, Oh yeah, it'd be great. Blah, blah, blah. And fast forward. And we had it basically. So just looking back on that, like I, I was so grateful to um, experience that and to talk with him and, and everyone. And um, so, yeah, great. Amazing. You had a really good interview with Strombo too. Strombo is like the interviewers interview. Like he's, the best <laughs> you know and so i was so excited for you thank you yeah and i was excited so the craziest thing about that and to this day it still again blows my mind the fact that it was apparently rick that got me that interview um like many people i try i bugged strombo i messaged him a few times he saw my messages but he didn't respond I was like okay and then one day he said okay let's do it i was like oh okay and then during the interview yeah he and i put a clip of this up somewhere and he's like yeah it was it was up it was rick who suggested it um he put in a good word for you and because otherwise i i don't do many interviews i'm like oh okay and so that was like ridiculous and i was like rick like you're you're just the best um and yeah strombo i mean like he's interviewed everyone so like yes. the fact that i interview him like he's a fucking legend so i i, I hope you could interview him that would be amazing I got to get up the courage to interview him. I haven't even asked him yet because I'm so in awe of him and how good he is at everything he touches. <laughs> so I'm yeah. like, I'm working up the courage to ask him. Yes. I, I get that. And you know, it's funny. And, and now that I think about it and I, I should, I've been or, more nervous maybe, but just me, my personality, I don't feel like I get starstruck that easily. Which is, um, you, Yeah. You, you held yourself very, awesomely like it was a great interview thank you no like i definitely met i prepared for it and i think that's important for any interviews to prepare for your subject who you're talking to mm -hmm. um but i think him specifically like i don't think he'll care if you know everything about him you know i don't think you need to try to impress him like specifically him you know what i mean mm -hmm. i think you just have to just be uh genuine and just show a passion in you know whatever topic you're talking about and i think he'll appreciate that I think that's what you should do with all interviews, really, right? Just show, show your your interest. Um, you remember Nardwar, the human serviette? Do I remember Nardwar? Of course, no. <laughs> yes. No. I want to no. interview him. You should get him too. Trust me, I would love to. And people have said, yeah, try to. I would love to. So the only contact, he has like a website and I've tried using the contact from there and nothing. So um honestly a lot of these interviews i feel like you just got to know the right people know the right connections someone who knows someone mm -hmm. um yeah because he's yeah he's like the epitome of like canadian music journalists i think him and strombo really mm -hmm. and it's so interesting the questions he comes up with for uh for people where they're just like how do you know that 
<laughs> yeah. I, 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 when I first started interviewing people, I really framed my interview. I tried to be like him. I was like, I need to know everything about these artists so I could get those reactions because that's what people love. And I did like get some of those, re those reactions and it is great. But at the same time, I'm like, there's only one Nardwar. I can't be him. So let me just do what I can. And and that's it. But uh, yeah, he's keep uh, doing keep doing what you're doing because it's really working. I have to say it's great. You, no, and you keep doing your thing. And what's the deal with the. Uh, with new kids when are we getting a, the interview oh man oh man that is you know <laughs> one day in the perfect world that is my bucket list dream is to have a new kids interview i will be i haven't actually said this to anybody but except the, the friends that know publicly um in june they are doing the magic summer tour with paula abdul and dj jazzy jeff across the u.s mm -hmm. and two dates in toronto you should go check it out uh do you know when I'll get back to you on that because <laughs> I the think summer. they're it's in the summer. They're all outdoor amphitheaters. So what was it? The Budweiser stage in Toronto is probably where they're going to be. Are you going to are you trying to come here for that? I actually have tickets in Chicago and Detroit and right. I have an individual meet and greet. So I get to see all five guys and me. Okay. okay. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, I'm, I assume it's like a very quick, like, like a picture and that's it. Is that it's all you pretty quick. I think it's about five minutes. Yeah. I mean, I would say either like try to bring your recording equipment with you, or if you can reach out to some contact, be like, listen, like this is my podcast, blah, blah, blah. And like, hopefully you can interview them somehow in person. We know that Donnie Wahlberg knows that the podcast exists because he gave it a shout out on the cruise two years ago. Um, so it's just a matter of timing, I think. And, you know, all of that but i'm just going to take that opportunity to ask them a couple of cool questions and and you know just have some pictures together and uh it'll be great i'm excited are you is this are you doing this by yourself or, or with a friend by myself but i'm meeting friends down there because we have a good core group of of girlfriends who hang out and love new kids and we'll all be there together so it's so gonna, be gonna great. say like if you had a friend going with you to like take video just it would be nice if you can get video footage of you interacting with them it would be nice, but what what they have set up is you can't bring in you can't bring in your phones or your purses or anything like that. So you got your time to talk to them, and then there's going to be professional photography, so you'll get all the pictures and everything. Okay, I could right. I could be like Donnie, can you get your cell phone out and we'll do this little video? <laughs> You're right. No, listen, you never know. Shoot your shot. I mean, I think with all these things, when it comes to like getting these interviews, whoever. A lot of it is patience and I'm still learning that because yes, like I'm very like eager to want to reach out to people and just do an interview, but yeah, you like, you just, you never know. So I think we just got to both keep at it. And, uh, eventually if I think things will, will always work out in, in the end for the, for the most part. A hundred percent. We just got to keep doing what we love and keep doing the job we're doing. I think, I mean, I wanted to interview Sass Jordan forever and I never didn't think I was going to get the interview but I finally did. And I didn't have to pass to her, which was nice. <laughs> Baby, yeah, exactly. So you never know. And uh, in the words of B44, I'm going to make you come tonight over my house. I don't know where that's. <laughs> that makes no sense. But that was the best lyric. I don't know. It is the best lyric. Oh, wow. Thank you, John. We will have to do this again sometime. It's always good. Yes. No, thank you so much. And uh, for everyone who's watching, go check out the Dope Nostalgia podcast for all your nostalgia needs. <laughs> all the needs. I know. It's great. And uh, same with you. You're on TikTok. You're on Instagram. John G.87 or is it John dot G? You got it. John dot G. Dot G. 87. <laughs> You're going to love it. It's going to be great. <laughs>
Social media, yeah, we've got it. Send us an email, dopenostalgiapodcast at gmail.com. Twitter, Nostalgia Dope. Or on Insta, dope underscore nostalgia. This podcast is licensed by SoCan because we believe that artists should be paid for their work.